O oh God, grant us a vision of our city, fair as she might be. A city of justice, where none shall prey on others. A city of plenty, where vice and poverty shall cease to fester. A city of brotherhood, where all success shall be founded on service and honor shall be given to nobleness alone. A city of peace, where order shall not rest on force, but on the love of all for the city. Well, the way this government is at the moment, I'm afraid it's, I think it's absolutely disgusting. They're taking money off us here, there and everywhere. And they just don't give a damn. Not for the working class, they don't. And it's the rich getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. So what we've got to do over the next eight weeks is we're starting with nothing. We've got a company, we've got Engels' text, and we've got eight weeks to devise, structure, design, light, market, and eventually this company are going to perform over four nights in two different locations, a live performance based on Engels' text, the condition of the working class in England in 1844. At the moment I live with five other people all of them, like, working class, like, lasses and lads that did particularly well, got into uni. And every single one of them at the moment has a degree, a, like a decent degree, and they're all working at the jobs in either, like, Sainsbury's or Wagamama's, just really, really just, and doing really awful hours for all the work they, that they put in. So basically just, I'm here because I'm angry. <laughs> Good. It's a great idea, great reason for being here. I think it's automatically associated with people on benefits. I think that's what the way that the working class is represented now. I don't think it's about pe I, I think that's what it's become synonymous with is like, oh, benefits grounding. And like when people talk about Salford, it really pisses me off that that's what it's associated with. It's associated with crime mm -hmm. and people on benefits. That's what the working class is now. The working class are these people on the benefits. And the it's, non-working class. That's what's the, exactly. Isn't. There used to be a wonderful pride, and I still feel it, that I've got wor working class roots. And I was proud that, you know, my dad went to work in, in the pit and this and that, and in the steel factory and, and all that. But there, there can't be any pride for people who are being in the position, like Jenny just said, where they're considered the lower class, and there aren't any damn jobs. So they can't have pride in being a worker because they can't work. I think what being working, I mean, I do say that to tell myself as working class because I have to sell my labour. I've got no, no choice about it. Either I sell my labour or I um, starve or, you know, survive on 67 pounds a week um, on the dole. In 1844, an observer, Frederick Engels, wrote, Everywhere heaps of debris, refuse and offal, standing pools for gutters and a stench which alone would make it impossible for a human being in any degree civilised to live in such a district. Such a district exists in the heart of the second city of England, the first manufacturing city in the world. It was whilst I was reading the book that I realised that the changes that I was recognising were all very superficial changes. 
So people have got slightly better homes, some people live in slightly nicer areas, but the big issue is that, that divide, that separation between the people who have very, very little and the few people who have it all. The ideas felt so relevant, they felt so today that it felt like it, it could have been written 100 years ago or two days ago. No, nothing's really changed, we're still in the same situation. There is still, you know, there's still the working class who essentially serve the upper class. And then so when I found out that it had been written in 1844, I just couldn't comprehend that there haven't been more people that have gone. That clearly is a direct link to everything that's been happening and is still happening and nothing's changed. The only difference that I can really tell from the book from when it was written then to present day is a certain amount of technology. People are still working jobs for extremely long hours in really, really poor conditions. In his book, Engels talked about Salford and he talked about the way people were being treated like animals, herded around and crammed in and pushed about. And that's exactly the same today. That's how people are treated. If they're not, if they're not high flyers, in, in the social setup, they're pushed around and they're treated like animals. So this recession, yeah, it just seems to be getting worse. I mean, my, um, I, uh, I was on DLA and me, uh, me DLA benefits have gone down, even though the condition hasn't changed. Uh, I could appeal, but uh, I contacted the Citizens Advice Bureau and they basically told me that, um, that right across the board, you've got to make a certain percentage of cuts um, the government, well, they, 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 they're trying to reach a target. Things aren't perfect, so how do we change them? How do we make them better? And I think that, that theatre is a wonderful way because it, uh, it, it makes people think outside of the box or even inside of the box. It just makes people think. What we need to see in the theatre is people's real passion. We need to see real people saying real things. Are you gentle twats don't get it? You don't know how to let go! Brilliant. <laughs> do it, do it, do it all. Send it all straight over so it's like one laser beam, so it's all going there, so nothing comes back. So keep going. Don't pull back on it. Make sure you keep going. It drills right into the core of it. You gentle twats don't get it. You don't know how to let go. Well, the project itself and the the, the actual um, day to day, week by week progression of it so far is, has been very exciting and very um, enlightening because we're meeting new people, some of us know each other but most don't. I do think that the, the, the group is bonding. Because the ethos is the group, everybody shares the same feelings about injustice. Go extreme, go fucking mental, forget your fucking sentimental self. Really what? Good. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to create, you have to trust. So as the trust is building, you can feel, you can feel the room changing. You can feel the excitement in the room. Maybe it's because of the style of theatre that we're trying to use, but anything that kind of pulls people out of their comfort zones, I don't think, I think people read stuff in the newspaper and can sort of take it or leave it. It doesn't necessarily have an impact and change their views. I don't think people change their views unless they're confronted with it. And I think that's why theatre lends itself to it, because you can portray like people's stories in their lives that someone will connect with and then sort of, like I was saying, pull them out of the comfort zones and represent it in a different way and say, well, actually, this is your life, but have you looked at it in this context and, and, and what, why, you know, what does it mean? What we're doing here will be more, represent, more representative um, because when it comes to theatre or it comes to a lot of art forms in the first place, especially with any dramas, the only people that are making the decisions about what working class people are are people that don't have working class experiences. So, inevitably, if it's coming from a source where, it's, where it is working class people or people that have those interests, that it, of course it will be, it's, it's truer. Abusive, corrosive, no, abusive, corrosive. Futile. Um, right, abusive, corrosive, volatile, 
Um, don't tell me it's to do with shagging your brother. <laughs> Incestuous, ridiculous motherfuckers, right? I've been to an audition before for a theatre school in London and a guy that was helping me run it um, went to Cambridge, was it? But then um, he didn't want to go because he didn't like getting told what to do, so Daddy was going to pay for him to have a year out while he decided what he wanted to do. And in the midst of all this, he didn't, he'd, I didn't spoke because I don't integrate in auditions, I just keep myself to myself, and all the girls were flapping around him, talking about how long they've done ballet and all this. And he started on going, because all the, all the rest of the girls were well-spoken, going on about how the Northern accent doesn't belong on a stage, and how, um, what was it, Northern accent doesn't belong on a stage, the Northerners belong in factories, and then he started going on about how um, there was a girl from up north who had a, a pronounced accent, and it, him and a group of friends in this theatre group bullied her that much to the point where she left. And I just, at this point, I just stood up and I was you know what, fuck this, I don't want him to do this, if this is what you're about, and I walked out. I'm not going to name the company because they're quite big, but yeah, I've had it, just because you've got an accent means you're you dimmer. Well, it's not true. It's not yeah. true at all. Doesn't matter where you're from or who you are. Yeah, I can relate to that, obviously, being scouts. <laughs> <laughs> so. You genteel twats don't get it. You've got no fucking idea how to let go. Fuck me. Loosen your stiff upper lip. Rip out the taste of your silver spoon. Go extreme. Go mental. Forget your sentimental self. Mm -hmm. Test yourself and disregard your health. Right, you just work together well on stage, as in, so like all that playing around, and you move with it organically. That's why, that's why I don't want to block it because I think it's far more interesting watching you the way that you you take it in turns. It's like the yin and yang, and then sometimes you come together, which works very well. Hi. <laughs> we are definitely the lowest of the low, mate. You're the lowest of the low. Yeah, I Even think so. Even someone slightly above me was making yeah. out that I was yeah. the lowest of the low. Well, I figured out because I, I think it was somebody I was say, with a slightly you know, higher number than I think sure. we've all got. Yeah. And sure, treat me like shit. <laughs> yeah. I just thought, I'm definitely, I'm I'm definitely really down there. I'm at the bottom of the pile, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm fairly low down, actually. I think I'm probably two, yes. <laughs> or lower, no, can't be lower than two. Because um, people are, uh, apart from Stephen, who's quite happy to talk to me, no one will talk to me, and everyone's kind of looking at me in a horrible way, and uh, they're not really interested in uh, engaging with me, particularly the royals. <laughs> Well, I think I'm quite high, yeah. People keep asking me if I've got enough tea and if the tea's nice. I can not get a clue. Just because everybody wants to shake my hand. Yeah, and they're a bit... A few people have bowed at me. We don't have a lot of time, so what we're going to try to do now is we're going to really surge forward and try and create in creating material that from that we can create scenes, we can create sketches, we can create monologues, we can create songs. So, and it's all coming from your experience. My new school was called Richmond County School for Girls, a stone's throw from the Royal Park and within the 60s elite suburbia. On the first day when I was talking, I saw the other girls watching me as I spoke with something like disbelief. When we were parting at the end of the day, I said, Tara. And then they all laughed and asked her to repeat it. They asked what it meant and she explained. No, they told her. Here we say bye bye, but don't worry, you'll be having elocution lessons with us so you will learn how to speak properly. It was a wake up call for me and I realised that I would have to change and adapt quickly to fit in with my new, new peer group if I didn't want to be ridiculed and looked down upon. She conscientiously worked on losing her northern accent and ways to ad adopt their accent. She learned to act the part and it became a way of her life. It took many years for her to decide that she had a right to be herself, class status included. I mean, I'll, I'll admit, I, throughout my entire life, my family's been very much about the idea of not getting into politics because it just makes things worse. Why can't anybody in the Northwest get a friggin' job anymore? I want to have an idea about these politics. It's lady not for what? Margaret fucking Thatcher, that's who. <laughs> I fucking hate Margaret Thatcher. I'd fucking twat her if I could fucking catch her. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, um, 
sort of opened my, my, my eyes up in terms of seeing the world for what it is. Uh, I know it's, that sounds stupid, but I sort of live in... I live through music. That's all I do on a daily basis. And uh, sort of doing this project is, and meeting people um, and hearing their stories has sort of definitely opened my eyes up to a lot of things. Look a little closer and see with your own eyes. See with your own eyes. Yeah. See with your own eyes. Basically, all I did was all I do is music, and this has sort of opened up a a vortex inside me where I need to sort of gorge on all these ideas and all these things that people have told me and all their experiences. Yeah. As I look around the place I live, it's not hard to understand why we're a nation that's been divided. Two shades of green to this land. The bright green luscious meadows, where the grass is clean and sweet, to the wastelands. There's more joy than that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay now, come on. You got Tim Burke. <laughs> Being here and being part of the group has reignited a lot of the passion that I had when I was younger, particularly for in, with regards to the way things are going on. And I really can't emphasise how much it has made a difference to my life and my views now, because it literally has rekindled a lot of the passion that I knew I used to have and unfortunately had died, had died off. Now, I wrote that 30 years ago, when I was 18. What's changed? And I'm getting even more idea of how the working class is really getting put down now, because I've met all these other people who have felt these pressures and disadvantages. Hands up, that idea that all this energy is here, it's just very quickly. Okay, you did it absolutely fantastically the last time. So. Okay, when it gets to Michael this time, you're going to turn it round. Oh. Nice one. Just so we don't go too dizzy. Just like that. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Okay, when it gets to Rose this time, I'm going to stop. At the end of the day, people talk about politics, but from my background, I, I, I'm not heavily steeped in in politics, but for me, politics are people. Politics are the way that we live together. And I think that people are better at this and they, they can be better at, it, at working to, together. They didn't have a fucking clue about anything. And if, if, we linked, if I linked arms to them, because I was Northern, they, they, and this was years and years ago before it was heard of, they would say, oh my God, she's homosexual. That's what they did. <laughs> <laughs> because they just didn't understand any of that tactile stuff, because it was Northern. So, so play it, you know, that's who you are. My school was called Richmond County School for Girls. For girls. Right, so you're picking it up here. This is your dress, accentuated. Girls, so you're in first position, second position ballet. Has everybody done ballet? No. Good. Right, that's first. That's first. Everybody get first. First position. What are you doing, Jenny? Nothing. Now you wet yourself. When we were parting at the end of the day, I said, Ta da! Cheerfully in my northern way. And they all laughed. <laughs> no, they told me, here we say, Bye bye. But don't worry, you'll soon be having elocution lessons with us. And so you will learn how to speak properly. How now, brown cow? My heart drives a jaguar. I would never have thought about what happened to me as a damaging thing, but once I put it into words and wrote it on paper, and we've stylized it and dramatized it, actually that was a terrible thing to do to a 12 year old. I conscientiously worked on losing my northern accent and ways. 
How now, brown cow? <laughs> and adopted then. How now, brown cow? <laughs> I learned to act the part and it became a way of life. How now, brown cow? It took many years before I decided that I had a right to be myself, class status included. I always wanted to be a doctor. I always wanted to be a doctor and I, I had, um, I was in a position in the posh school with 13 mock O-levels and my stepfather said to me, this is absolutely true, my fa stepfather came to a parents' evening, found out that I was on this mission to become a doctor and said, this isn't going to happen because we need you to leave school at 16 and earn a living at a bank or because you'll get a good job because you're bright. So. He wasn't a nice man, but they wanted my income and I didn't want to leave school, I wanted to be a doctor. So that was where that all began and because I wouldn't leave school and go to a bank and give him my earnings, they threw me out. So I was thrown out at 14 and a half and went and became an au pair till I was old enough to get a job. school and on my first day I got singled out by one of the teachers as being the only kid from council estate within the school and from then I started getting treated um, a little bit more differently. It was as if everyone's expectations of me suddenly shifted and even though I knew I had as much right to be there as anyone else I no longer felt the same as them. Governments with um, ancient policies on schools whereby they're trying to bring their middle class, no, not even middle class, because it's either middle aristocratic values to a general schooling system that they have absolutely no idea about. So what they believe is, well, it worked for them, so why won't it work for us? Well, I'm sorry, Mr Gove and all your mates, um, learning poetry at the age of five, the batum, and reciting them out in class is a backward step, I'm afraid. And for me personally, if it had happened to me at five, I'd have pissed me pants, because he had an horrible stutter. So I wouldn't have got through the first word, probably. I've always understood that education is, is paramount. Um, I. I I um, w wasted the chance of a grammar school education when I was a, a schoolboy and then never got the opportunity thereafter. So I always longed to do it. And so I went four years ago and went back to university. And, um, and it's been the best thing I, can, I could have ever done. There's no question. Education is just everything. There's no question. Education is everything. The, the, Again, we see attacks now, not only on the education system, but in particular on the humanities, the arts, English as non-vocational, no bloody point to it. Uh, and that makes me angry because that's, those are the subjects that will progress society, that will enlighten and teach and, and open minds. Learning how to make a rocket in the engineering school whilst it's great and important isn't going to open anybody's mind. Learning about biology and chemistry and stuff like that isn't going to open anybody's mind. And, and so we see, um, certainly at, at universities like, like Salford, what you would describe as a working class university in a working class town, in the working class north of England, 
is coming under attack. I'm from a working class background myself. Um, I'm the first person in my family to come to university and there's no way I'd think about coming to be an undergraduate now um, paying nearly nine grand fees because I just couldn't afford it. So my journey's getting smaller and my load is getting larger. So one tell me who's in charge. Yeah, let's kick them up the ass, ass, ass. Um, what I think is really happening is that the rich look after the rich, to be honest. I got my GCSEs and I couldn't believe it and then I got my A-levels and I couldn't believe it and then the next minute I was like, right, well I'm in uni and I went to Queen's University of Belfast and got offered a scholarship for drama and I turned that down partly because of the distance but also because the university was a bit like Hogwarts and everybody was walking around, you know, in really... And I just thought, I'm never going to fit in here. I, cu I couldn't. No. I'd be well uncomfortable. Oh, <laughs> 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 My collaboration with the project is just to run a session on Theatre of the Press and all the Augusto Boal techniques. To Boal, uh, we don't rehearse for the play, but we rehearse for life. Mm? We rehearse for changes, and we rehearse for the revolution. Okay, don't get anticipated. Ah, get yeah. <laughs> don't react before. Okay. Okay. Boal says that uh, the working classes don't have a narrative that represents them in the theatre. James, James, you must go back to them and tell them that's not enough. It's nowhere near enough. Well, sack the bloody workers, I've said it before. What? <laughs> One of the beauties of this project is uh, that the actors are not all professional ones. Hey, hey, you know what business? Fuck off! It's a mixture of people coming from the community wanted to be part of this project. That's the wrong point. Get out from the roof. I don't give a fucking fuck. Get out from my arches and get on where they can fucking see you. Come on, stop in the street. And to tell the story that Engels portrayed in his book. When we compare historical events with um, actual current ones, we can find a synthesis that can make a theatre piece something really powerful. What happens? Break it up. What happens? Tell us what you could see. The theater is a political act. Even when they stage a big musical, while showing the musical, they are silencing other things. So normally the arsenal of the enemy is narrative. It's semantic. It's made of words. It's made of commonplaces. Mm. Splashed on us as if it were a bucket of shit. As you will be aware, this council recognises and supports the coalition government's commitment to stimulating growth. I started when I was 14, and nobody else in my class worked, but I did, and I paid. You know, I paid rent at home at 14, half my big wages went to my mum and that's how it was because that's how it was with her family. So, but it wasn't, you know, I've always worked because that's what you did. Whereas I've got friends who have never, never had a part-time job. It was a shock when they finished uni, when they actually had to go and, do, you know, yeah. earn to five Monday to Friday. When I was about three or four years old, um, they were re-showing it in a cinema. And my parents thought, this is brilliant. We'll take our daughter out to go see Bambi. <laughs> And it gets to the part in the film where it's Bambi running around in the snow going, Mother, Mother! Mother! And I, at my young age, yell out, and I'm, I yelled it out, in, and I've, I can still remember it, it's one of my earliest memories, yelling out in the middle of the cinema, She's gone to work! And of course, I thought that was natural, that if you call out Mother and she doesn't answer, she's at work. I've tried to think of something that was industrial, connected to some idea of what we're trying to do here. And I, I really, there was one 
the story that is just paramount in my mind. It's 1979, Thatcher had come to power overnight with a landslide. And I remember, well, I, I worked in a factory about three, four miles from here with about 5,000 workers, about 3,500 on the shop floor. Powerful, powerful trade union. All, all powerful. And I'd been for years, great terms and conditions, great pay, great pensions, great short hours. We only worked 32 hours a week, all that stuff. It was phenomenal. At the height of union power, we gained from it. And in 1979, when Thatcher came to power with the landslide, we went into work the morning after, and the managers were waiting for us, instructed by senior management, to stand there and say, it's our turn now. And that's what they did to us. And they waited for us, and they told us all, watch your backs, it's our turn now, because Thatcher was won. And within months, the, the rider to that is, of course, within months, they just come round and they called it making people redundant. They were sacking people. <laughs> Come on, let's get this show on. I've been waiting for this day for years to shove it back down the front of those cocky union bastards. Thatcher shut most of it. She shut all, all of, most of the companies in Trafford Park when she was in power. Because she shut all the pits and all that. And was, this is a big mining area. And Swinton here, just down the road, there was about uh, 12 pits up the East Lanks and everywhere around there. And just over there, Hcroft. There was everything here, engineering works all over the place. Metavix was the biggest company. 21,000 worked there. That's gone. When Ray first talked about you know, presented Fleckers and talked about Thatcher and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. It's stuff I've read about. It didn't really mean anything to me in terms of like, I didn't connect with it in that way. I, it was just history. Whereas now it's like, you know, people went through that and it was fucking horrendous and it's, it's happening again. I'm, a, I'm one of Thatcher's children and I guess mine was the first generation of people who didn't expect to get work when they left school. And, you know, I've found it extremely difficult to get any sort of career together because every time I get a job that lasts more than, say, a few years, I'd be made redundant and then I've had to start all over again. With the Thatcher government, with the breaking down of the working class uh, industries, such as mining, um, such, as the, such as a lot of the mills and stuff like that, um, I think she's taken away the working class man's dignity. But at the same time, brought in institutions like banks and cash generator and organisations like that to fleece the poor even more. I am sick of standing in working class areas attempting to use the only cash point they've got for three miles away and being charged £3.75 for it. You scumbags. How can you do that knowing that you're robbing the poor and you're a millionaire? But now that seems to be the cool thing to do, to have loads of money, but want even more. Every type of shop you could think of is here, on here, on the round there. But not, oh, gone. Everything's gone. They're all second hand shops, aren't they? Most of the second hand shops. No, the, most second hand the shops here been now. Taken there's away elsewhere. A couple of pound shops. And supermarkets took everything out. You've got the city centres, the big businesses, you've got Asda and all of that, they're taking away things from the smaller businesses. Like, for instance, when as the first was supposed to open, it wasn't going to do anything that the market was doing. I started first on the market. It wasn't going to be doing certain things. Then when it came, it's doing everything that the market traders was doing. So it knocked them off as well as myself. So I moved elsewhere. And obviously still, with it being close by, I still got the competition because you just can't beat as this prices, you know? That basically, that's really it. All big, big businesses are just taking away things from the working class who are trying to make a living. It's difficult. Because I work in a store in the Trafford Centre, Wallace, which Philip Green, this multi-billionaire, owns, and he's shutting stores down left, right and centre, and it's affecting people who I work with who are single mums or, you know, you know, older people that have just got, like, mortgages still left to pay off and everything, and he's just shutting shops because he can.
Everybody's struggling down there. Youths can't get no jobs. They're taking everything. They've taken everything. There's, there's hardly anything for, for, for people now. It all seems so hopeless. Scraping and pinching and never getting any better off. OK, a quote about work. Um, another source of demoralisation among the workers is their being condemned to work as voluntary. Productive activity is the highest enjoyment known to us. So it's compulsory to toil the most cruel, degrading punishment. Nothing is more terrible than being constrained to do, to do some one thing every day from morning until night against one's will. Um, I can kind of relate to that because my dad worked as a mechanic, which is kind of classed as a working class job. And I remember him coming home and being slightly, well, very angry about having to do the same thing over, over, over and over again. He saw it as being menial, but he wanted to move out of it, but didn't have the skills to move out of it. Um, obviously that's in relation to the being constrained to do the work. He was dependent on that money as well, so he couldn't actually branch out and do something that he wanted to do. He's right. It's our fucking turn now, lads. <laughs> you just look each other. When you're ready, Jake. What are you doing again? Sounds <laughs> It was uh, a big day in, in my politicisation, my understanding of politics at a grassroots level on the factory floor and how the, the Thatcher victory the night before or through the night had affected us immediately, um, us in the factories and in the trade unions by the change, instant change in attitude of the management. So yeah, it was a big day because it was, it was a shock. I didn't really expect it. I'd never seen anything like it. Hey, you look like a bad night for you a lot, eh? Yeah, I like yeah, all right, mate. All right. Tell me about it. Did you go and vote like I told you, though? I bet he didn't. And this project has just made it resurface in my consciousness, really. Um, and hopefully we can use it and the other anecdotes and tales that the, the, the cast has come up with to tell the tale, to tell the stories that highlight the inequalities and discrepancies and the gaps between the haves and have-nots, etc., and how politics matters. I pray for a future for my kids. I think that's the right word I should say. I pray for a future for my kids that my life will be an example for them, so that they can at least... I want them to continue where I left off then. If, they, if I die and I've still got these premises, that they'll be able to just carry it on or maybe expand it or find something and, and know that they can achieve something and not have it taken away from you. Do you understand? Build up your community, set an example for those who's coming after you. That's what I want. That's how it should be. Back in the day, this was not like this. My side wasn't like this. My side was one of the richest parts in Manchester. Remember, I'm telling you that. And look at it today. It's basically, it's everywhere, really. Everywhere. People can't get jobs. People can't get this. Education. They promise the students this, that and the other. And then lied about it. And all it is is benefiting fat cats. Do you think you're going to stop having violence on wars? If there's no jobs, it breeds violence. Create jobs, it lessens violence. Seriously, trust me, I, that's all it is. You've really upset me rather right now, to be quite honest with you. You really have.
hear this, except the blunt way the news hit me, I guess. He spanked me. The fact that I had no money was the only reason I stuck around in that job. It was hell. I hated it. It was one of the most degrading things I think I've ever made myself do. Every shift was the same routine. Go to work, do my best, get a slap on the ass when I wasn't paying attention. Mainly just so he could hear me squeal. I literally only did it because if I didn't, I would literally have not had any food, just none. What with living in the house and, and paying for rent and, and bills and I, I was ashamed as well. I just, I couldn't, I didn't want to tell lots of people because I knew if I told them, they'd be like, oh, well, have some money, have, have, have this, because I have great friends. And they would want me to, you know, have money and, 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 and eat. But, well, I shouldn't have had to be in that position in the first place. And if it hadn't been for the position I was in because of the class I was in, I never would have had to stick to that job. I could have walked out the, the minute that things got rough and I could have not worried about where my next meal was coming from. A few months later, he straight up told me to my face that he hired me for my bra size. That was it. He said he could have picked anybody. What? He said he could have picked anybody, but he picked me because I was skinny and had a great pair of knockers. It was really hard trying to stay there with the abuse and but knowing that there was nothing I could do about it. There was nothing I could do. I had to stay. I had to keep going and I kept going for nine months. It's only now that I realise that I wasn't really there to pull pints for money. I was selling sexual favours for a square meal a day. I feel so angry. I hate the manager for what he did to me and, and how he made me feel. I still have nightmares. I feel angry that there was no nothing I could do, nothing I could do to get money. In the late summer of August 42, there had been a sequence of events in the Northwest, sometimes known as the Plug Plot Riots, uh, but better described, I think, as a general strike, which had actually seen Manchester effectively under working class control for a week, as uh, trade unions and chartists met and declared that they would strike both for better pay and for the introduction of the charter. Chartism, my friends, is no political movement, but the main point is getting the ballot. Chartism is like a knife and fork question. The charter means a good home, good food and drink. Prosperity, shorter working hours. So one of the things that's often overlooked, I think, is that when Engels arrives in Manchester, he comes to find a working class that, yes, is mired in poverty, yes, is living in a in appalling living conditions, but it's also a working class that is fighting back. One, two, three, four. Strike, 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 Where are you men? What about a bit of solidarity? Come on! We all you! Find your balls, give him a scream! Strike! At the moment, I'm going through the 1842 uh, charterism strikes, which are the mass strikes that were held in Manchester, uh, seeing how they relate to uh, the Engels text, uh, because it, it is mentioned uh, in part of the book. Uh, it was obviously based very much 
uh, around Manchester, although it did come down from Staffordshire. Uh, and I'm just timelining it so that we can, you know, see how uh, it progressed because it was quite strategic, really. They they built from the outside of Manchester uh, before they came into Manchester because they knew that because it was a garrison town that they wouldn't be able to just come in and take all the uh, the mills and factories out. It's almost like a collective, it's a collective memory, which is, if we don't record it, it's going to be lost because, you know, it's not going to be recorded by uh, the government or the BBC or uh, Fox Corporation or whoever it is that's going to make films. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Helen Huntley-Smythe and this is tonight's news from the Bourgeois Broadcasting Corporation on the 26th of July in the year of our Lord, 1842. You look at the, you know, what's going on with austerity now, uh, people to you know, supposed to be taking wage cuts in some of the councils and that was what all the charterism was about, the, uh, the mill owners were looking at reducing wages by 25%, uh, so there's obviously the comparison there. <laughs> The working class knows too well, has learned from repeated experience, the law is a rod which the bourgeois use and has prepared for him. I've been arrested over the past year six times um, in the course of protesting peacefully against the cuts and austerity measures. <laughs> And I've got a trial coming up and it just seems that the police um, are criminalising peaceful protesters at a time when um, the rich, the bankers, are tax evading to the tune of billions of pounds which is throwing like the, the world into kind of economic meltdown and poverty and they are not being charged or brought before the law at all that rich people like the MPs who fill their expenses and don't have any, the law thrown up at them at all, um, get off scot-free when peaceful protesters and people, rioters, people who riot because they're so frustrated, they're living in poverty, have like really, really harsh um, prison sentences doled out to them. As part of the Trades Council's work, we do a lot of historical uh, commemorative events. So every year we commemorate Peterloo which is where you know hundreds of people were killed because they were marching for the vote. It's our to hear spread. One of the interesting things about Peterloo, for example, is that there were hundreds of mill girls, uh, mill workers from women from uh, Oldham and other outlying towns marching for the vote. Now, we're told when we were growing up that women's suffrage was nice middle-class women in London breaking stones and throwing themselves under the king's horses. We're not told that it, it's ordinary men and women like us that got the vote, that, 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 that were marching for the vote a century before the, the, the uh, nice middle class women. You know, everything, particularly on this floor here where it seems to be more 1970s, 1980s, I was never taught any of it in school. It was based, I mean, I can just remember seeing, you know, things on the TV when I was young. So, for instance, the miners' strike. You know, I, I don't know the reasons behind it so much. All I can remember is watching the TV and watching, you know, riot vans and police fighting against miners. And I was never, you know, nobody really taught me, you know, why it was happening or anything like that. They always stop at 1945 and said you should be teaching them about the, mi the miners' strike now. You should be teaching mm -hmm. them about mm -hmm. what there is to lose in terms of the NHS. Mm -hmm. Not this kind of, well, we don't discuss the modern changes because they're not quite history yet. To me, history is so important so that we remember what we used to do and what we can still do. And also because it informs the present. It says, yeah, we can get change. We can organise together. Our forefathers, our foremothers did. 
I think the company itself, the Ragged Collective, uh, as they are now called, the talent that comes from out of them is amazing, is absolutely outstanding. And I have been pushing them <laughs> at a great rate of knots because of the lack of time. But as a company, they've just gone, OK, yeah, let's do this. And they've just bound together and helping each other. Somebody said that, oh, we, after a first week or two, they said, oh, now we feel that we want each other to do as well as possible. And that's it. It's because they all want each other to do as well as possible so that as a company, they can present something that they genuinely think can actually change things. I'm the dandy highwayman advised to be your leader, and I propose to make a mark by destroying you bottom feeders. The devil take your minimum wage on the old age pension. With this fucked economy, there's only one way to ease the tension. Okay, then get that. Okay, and then, yeah, back to back. Stand there. and deliver, or we'll fire you at will. I think it's a remarkable group of people that have come here to offer their, you know, to offer their time and their own voices and their own experiences, which some of their experiences are so close to the bone. They're so sort of moulded to themselves that it's very hard for them to step away from that. And they've offered up their own experiences, some not very comfortable at all, you know, not so very pleasant in any way, shape or form. And they've gone, well, the thing is, this was horrible, but I don't want this to happen to anyone else. And everyone else has been so respectful of that and supportive of them getting it out there that it's just gone from strength to strength. And in many ways, a lot quicker than a, a, a professional company would. Um, because I think in a way, probably be murdered by my peers, but it means a lot more to them. This means a lot, lot more than just a copy of a Shakespeare or a copy of a, um, you know, a Jacobean tragedy or a contemporary play. This, this text they're saying, this is their own words. This, a lot of this, it might be theatre, but it's not acting. This is their own dialogue. We were coming back from a night out, we got on the train at Polton, through to Preston, and there's a bunch of rival lads already there. Um, I think it was a stag do. Um, we got on the train and they were just being really rowdy and noisy. I got the odd, oi, get your tits out, that kind of comment. You, can, you expect that from pissed up lads. Then they started on an Asian bloke doing it really racist chants and stuff and it just really hit a nerve me. It really aggravated me. And rather be a Welshman, I'd rather be a Welshman than a Turk. Well, I'd rather be anything than a little ragged. Oi! Dirt stain! Probably can't understand me if it is in order for a takeaway. It's all they learn when they come over here, you know. Pigeon fucking English. It hit a nerve in me personally because um, I've, I have had previous relationship with um, black men myself. And I've had quite a lot of racial comments to myself, or oh, you wog shagger, and stuff like that, which is really upsetting and disgusting, the fact that people will just discriminate just because of the colour of your skin. You're the bacteria on the breath of humanity, now leave me alone! Rosie, leave it! I'm not leaving it. They think it's funny and it's just dragged up, where they're just dragged up, pissed up, fucked up men bullying. There's 15 of you and one of him. I was that fucking fair. He's a 17 year old lad. He's probably bricking himself. You need to fucking pipe down. How old are you lot? You need to get a grip of yourselves. Shut the fuck up. You've been having a go at me. Now you're starting on this Muslim lad. I felt like I had to stand up and do something because not enough people do it. Because if, we, if more people stand up and do something, then less light is going to be. Chelsea and Hayley start to try and calm just Chris what, what, down. Because Chris what, is the kind of lad that'll jump up and be like, right, come on then. Come on then. <laughs> 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 Stand up, you stand, and they all sort of, come on then, love will off you out, look, come on then, so I'm fucking, come on then, get in a fucking line, I'll fucking have you all. And the problem with us these days is we're fighting each other instead of fighting and giving up a hand to who's really causing the, the, job, cut, the job cuts. Because it's not immigrants coming into the country, it's the government. The government control everything. Not people who move here because they're disadvantaged of where they're actually from. I don't know how many people on top of him 
That's when I thought, fuck this, took my heels off and jumped on top of them all. Started swinging in punches or whatever, trying to get people <laughs> off. Well, I'm getting a kick in basically on the floor. You're getting right. your head yeah. kicked in, right. literally. Right. And then you drag, drag me off the pile, look me directly in the face, but this is all your fault, and smack me in the mouth. You stupid bitch! It was really scary. Um, it did knock my confidence using trains. It shook me up a bit because the men who out when the Rachel Bruce and beat me and my friends up were actually in the 50s rather than young lads didn't know any better. Would you do it again? Yes, in a heartbeat. So one of the things I really like about the condition of the working class in England is Engels' insistence on the humanity of working people and this is a quotation where Engels discusses that feature. In other ways too, the humanity of the workers is constantly manifesting itself pleasantly. They have experienced hard times themselves and can therefore feel for those in trouble. To them, every person is a human being, while the worker is less than a human being to the bourgeois. Whence, they are more approachable, friendlier and less greedy for money, though they need it far more than the property-holding class. For them, money is worth only what it will buy Whereas for the bourgeois, it has an especial inherent value, the value of a god, and it makes the bourgeois the mean, low money grubber that he is. You lost the docks, Salford docks. That's been gone a while, hasn't it? Yeah, that's been gone about nine years, ten years now, hasn't it, since it was shut. Now, there was thousands who worked there, and all the industries, what was off the docks, they went. And over there on what was the dock wharf, that's where our mill was. We had ships coming up full of wheat every week. Well, all that's finished, gone. Scene. You know when you go in here, what I want you to do, I want you to build a sort of little wall, so, and you can have this if you want it, but I want you to just do that section for me. Just let let, the prison, let, the let me show you the modern, and you did something quite interesting, let me show you the modern, like you let them in, you go let me show you the modern, so then you become, you're the, the person who takes on it. Yeah, okay. I'm a tour guide, <laughs> but every time you say here, I want you to build a wall, so yeah, I live here, here. Yeah. I work yeah. here, I work. So, yeah. so that each one of those here yeah. is a little bit, is a bit more of a Barry, yeah. yeah. Actually, in the city, they find it hard sometimes to recruit to call centre work because, you know, it, those sorts of jobs are not for the likes of Manx from Collierst or, you know, Newton Eve and even Moss Side. Um, and it's, you know, th that's the other really frustrating thing is, is that you have a city of so many contrasts. They, you know, they want students with nice accents to do call centre work. They cer certainly, who would want to travel a long way into the city of city centre of Manchester to, for a minimum wage job? You know, that, there's no sense in it at all. No, it's you and it's me and it's this space. The bourgeoisie has more in common with every other nation of the earth than with workers in whose midst it lives. The workers speak other dialects, have other thoughts and ideals, other customs and moral principles, a different religion, other politic than those of the bourgeoisie. Thus, they are two radically dissimilar nations, as unlike as difference of race could make them. The rich, uh, universally, it doesn't matter what language they speak in, they speak in the language of silence, don't they? Um, credit cards are silent, your Mercedes is silent, and um, 
and your clothes are silent, but they say so much about you. Typical, and I've traveled the world to see rich and poor live side by side. Um, in Manchester, Withenshaw, the largest housing state in Europe, is sandwiched by Hale, which is where all the footballers live, and Didsbury, um, which is pretty an affluent middle class area of the city. Um, and it doesn't seem to be a problem with it because, again, like Engels says, it doesn't matter because they never have to interrelate or intertwine, do they? Because they don't even speak the same language. They send the kids to separate schools. They buy from different shops. So whereas the working class might go to Netto, Fortnum and Mason for the rich. So they never cross cross each other's paths. And they try to avoid each other in as, in as many ways as possible socially and on a, on a daily basis. So we might live closely to each other, but they're very separate. Now, universally, the rich are the rich, and we've seen it all the time, the rich gather together in uh, rich gathering together type places. We deserve the glass. We deserve the style. We deserve never to see working class for a mile. This is my world, my own little hub, full of people like me to join the yacht club. Removed from your... Sorry. Sorry. Removed from your stench. Keep out if you please. You may have built it, but it's my sulphur keys. saturated with class prejudices poured into him from his earliest youth. There is nothing to be done with the bourgeois, he is essentially conservative in however liberal a guise. His interest is bound up with that of the property holding class. He is dead to all active movement. Um, but I think it's still very relevant. It's, uh, it's basically telling you exactly what we've got as a government at the moment. Um, they are still riddled with class prejudices. The Tories want to uh, destroy the working classes as far as I'm concerned. Every new law that they bring out is designed to oppress the working class and has been done for centuries. I actually think it's probably exactly the same now and hasn't changed ever since the system started. I mean, if you're rich, and you've got a lot, why would you change anything? It's only people that don't have anything that want change, that make progress. And give me some to show us when I come back that we can see. Okay, so a very quick one. Okay. Yeah, how do you feel about the fact that you've only got two weeks left? Uh, partly parping myself, but partly really excited. Um, yeah, I'm really excited actually. I'm, and it's, it's nice because when it goes live, I can let go. It's all everyone else's job. <laughs> it's amazing watching it all kind of come together because it's gone from being just a load of anecdotes and ideas to a full piece of theatre and yeah, it's just fantastic. I feel very confident. I think everybody's getting there. I think we're, I mean, you, you do in the circle with the songs and everybody and almost everybody's got all the words down. And, you know, some people go quiet, but we all pick it up eventually. And, and we're going through the rehearsals now and, and people are just right on the ball and there's only little things now that just need tweaking. Um, it's exciting, it's, um, it's an interesting project to be part of and it's getting people to think about things that maybe they wouldn't normally think about, which is exciting for me. Okay, I'm loving it. Sorry, I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> it's marvellous. <laughs> And how do you feel about the fact that you're going to be on stage in two weeks' time? Freaking it. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Michael, how do you feel about being part of this project? Absolutely fantastic. It's wonderful. It's coming together so brilliantly. It's exceeded all expectations. And I'm really, I'm so bloody nervous. But I'm also looking forward to it as well. I can't wait.
The workers must strive to escape from, the, from this brutalising condition to secure for themselves a better, more human position. And this they cannot do without attacking the interests of the bourgeoisie, which consists in exploiting them. But the bourgeoisie defends its interests with all the power placed at its disposal by wealth and the might of the state. In proportion, as the working man determines to alter the present state of things, the bourgeoisie becomes his avowed enemy. Well, it means those that are the people in power are going to use their power to make sure that we stay firmly in our position or what they perceive as our position, which is working class, never to escape from where we are to reach their dizzy heights. So, yeah, so I finished my degree and had managed to um, get through the three years, even with my health problems, just persevered on and rested when I could. And at the end of the degree, I found a job at the university, a really good job, uh, in international admissions, which would last for 13 weeks. And the, the old laws used to say that if you tried some work to get experience or onto your CV and uh, credibility on your CV, you could take some work and see how you got on. As long as you didn't work longer than two years, you were still eligible for your incapacity benefit if you had to stop. Well, it was only a temporary job, but I thought it would get me back in the job market and give me um, the opportunity to see how I would cope with um, a daily routine of working. And I did the interview and some tests. And that afternoon, they got in touch with me and said, we're very pleased to offer you the job. So I was elated because it meant that for the next three months, we could financially function, which is impossible to do, living on benefits. So I, I got in touch with the um, benefits office, or I got back to them to check that everything was still the same. And they said, the disability advice officer said to me, you really mustn't take this job. If you take the job, um, regardless of the fact that you're only going to earn for 13 weeks, because the laws have changed and there is no more incapacity benefit, when you stop, um, your incapacity benefit won't be returned to you. You won't be allowed to claim again. So I had to contact the university and apologise and not take the job, which is disheartening to say the least. It's disabled people throughout society who are suffering from um, the government cuts. Um, but obviously it does hit the working class far, far harder because the working class don't have the financial resources to survive unless they have government help. Um, well basically um, I had a letter to say that um, that they think that I'm able to work. Um, I have a rare condition called Williams syndrome and one in 25 million people have it um, and it's very hard for, for me to work because of um, the, the side effects of my condition. I also have um, epilepsy as well, which is a lot more worse. Um, I, I went to the interview and they just looked at me and thought, yeah, she can work. Um, so I had a battle against me and I lost the battle, basically. But it's not just about money. I think it's also an ideological attack on the very idea that the collectivity, or that in, you know, in the form of the state, should be um, protecting the most vulnerable people in society, i.e. that's people who aren't capable of going out and earning an income. This is our new fight, that the very foundations of happiness should be free to all. From the very centre of our city, let us resolve that the lessons of yesterday shall not be forgotten in our plans for tomorrow. Generally speaking, it's a, a group from various parts of the city, various backgrounds, various ages, genders, all that mix has just come together in, what, is there a dozen of us? I'm, I, I'm not counting. Um, and everybody's just got this, that goal in mind that we want this to work and that happened quite quickly with the storytelling, the anecdotes that we did at the beginning 
and how we formulated and started to devise the script and, and, and the whole show. And I just think that's bonded people and everybody started rooting for each other. Everybody was rooting for, because it's not easy for any of us to do this stuff, we're not actors. And so everybody was sort of supporting each other, willing him to do okay and willing everybody to do okay. And I think that just added to the the camaraderie, the fraternal feeling, to use a, a socialist term, is really good here. Um, Jenny leads it out, you see. Okay. So, for now, I just want Michael up the rear. That's fine, so as long as you have someone come up. Who knows it? Because like, if there's. Does JD? Did you ID one as well? Oh my goodness no. me, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alright, okay. Hey, Ray, it's really terrible. <laughs> what? Well, you're talking about the cross that she's got me on the stage. <laughs> Can't watch. I feel something very silly. I wish people would stop fucking about. It's okay. serious work time, this. <laughs> Build a bonfire. You know, they've pushed us into our own homes, haven't they? Of course they have, yeah. And privatised us, yep. or tried to privatise us, and it's really, really hard to punch out of that, and I think this has helped us punch out of it. Obviously, when there's a lot of opinions going into one part, it, it can, in theory, get like quite highly stressed, but it's not really because everyone's on the same page about talking about stuff, like working through any, any issues or ideas, really, actually on stage, just working through the ideas on stage, I think. Oh, no. No, I don't, I'm yet too fast. I want you to go slow, listen. I think that's one of the powers of the group, that most of the script is built on um, our own stories, and we know it's our own stories. And because we were telling our own stories for the purposes of the play, we got to know everybody quite quickly. We knew what each of us had been through at certain times, and that led on to other storytelling of each of us to each other so we got to know each other quickly in a, in a sort of a, a compressed way that would take maybe 10 times the amount of time this is so totally different because it affects you personally like being involved in drama and everything you have to like find an emotion or find a feeling from somewhere even if you've never felt it before but you've got to for that character whereas here because i've felt every single thing and when people are saying stories like about the prostitutes and i'm not a prostitute but you, you <laughs> kind of like empathize with them and you think ah, i've been in that position before so it makes it a lot different to when you're just being say juliet in romeo and juliet <laughs> Rosie took my monologue and and performed my monologue. That's when I sort of realised that there was a lot of anger there that I I wasn't aware of when I was writing it. Just fuck off! This is bullshit. And that's the one thing I take from this. I think there's a really really positive message mm. that no matter what shit they throw at us. There's still people there who are willing and prepared to fight back. Just when we think we can go and have a drink and forget about it, you go up prices on booze. <laughs> Fuck that, mate. We'll drink if we choose. Increasing the prices ain't gonna fucking stop us because it's the taxpayers' money we'll use on our Tesco visit. In it though, you conservative twat. This process of going through this has just made me want to go out and just shout about the actual suffering of working class people. It's just what you'd want in its quiet. For all those no nonsense northerners to go die in a fire. Because Lady Luck doesn't often hit our town because a lady can change her mind and frown. Because we're not as right. Because <laughs> we're legitimately even common as right. It's changed my life as well. Yeah, it changed my opinions. It's made me realise that in the next two years at uni, I can be myself. I don't have to try and be someone else at uni. I can be myself and I'm just as clever and determined as the other people.
but it's very enjoyable. It's, it's got a really nice family atmosphere going on. It's like a massive, sli slightly unconventional family. It's really nice. You, as a group of people, bound, actually not my expectations, out of the fucking court. You've just done so much, and I think it's amazing that a group of people who fucking never met any like each other, or you know, most of you, most of you never acted, can do something so fucking professional. And you can't. Your acting ability is amazing, and you've done it so quickly in so many things. But I just need you to go right. You've got four days, four days here, two days in London. I just really need you to be really strict with yourselves, really disciplined, and focus. I wasn't feeling nervous until Jimmy said, "If you're not nervous, you, you, you're doing the wrong thing." So now I feel like I am nervous. So I'm like, I'm doing the right thing. Shit. <laughs> We're gonna smash it. She's got to watch the rain doesn't fall off the stage. Yeah. Plunge me into the dark. I will fall off the stage. How do you feel? Um, nervous, excited, frantic. Arsy. Arsy. Well, we're off to act. for like auditions to go to and um, other kinds of like theatre groups that I could get involved in, similar to this. Um, but obviously doing this, I've realised the struggle that it is trying to be 100% committed as well as be able to live by like funding rent and food and, you know, just essential things really. Um, so. I can't give myself 100% to the drama industry because I still need to work and earn a living, which is very demanding also, working in retail. Yeah. Obviously I've been to a careers advisor and tried to um, find out what kind of routes I can go down um, and the only things that I have been offered because of my experience which is nothing to do with my degree it's just purely because I've worked in a um, retail job they're just you know supplying me with more retail jobs because that's the only experience that I've got and I just find it hard because how do you get experience if you're not offered the first do you know how do you gain experience in a field if you're not given a chance in the first place so um, I am a bit worried that I will just be stuck in retail because at the moment it is the only thing that's bringing in any kind of money for me. But um, I do want to eventually move into the drama field and now it just looks like the only option is for me to go and do a PGC and get into it that way through like teaching drama because I don't think I could live as an actor and be able to fund my lifestyle. Even just, and it's not that great of a lifestyle, it's literally just food and um, somewhere to stay. <laughs> I'm contracted to eight hours a week and I work nearly 32, so I'm on nearly a, a full time contract and trying to get time off to do something that I've got so much passion in. You know, at the same time, I've loved doing this experience, but it's also been quite a struggle because I've been worried about how I'm going to be able to afford it once the um, show is over, do you know what I mean? And all these things that I've like let build up. So, yeah.
It's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Best thing I've seen in a long, long time. And we want to come again. And London, yeah, good that it's going to London. But what about Liverpool? something that is so moving and funny and politically smart and sound and sort of things that should be being heard and seen on stage. It was a great experience. Enjoyed it. It's just the best thing I've seen in absolutely ages. It just—it was fabulous. Honestly, like, I was like nearly crying every time this was done. I was singing. You were like one minute, you were like one minute, you were crying.